Hey everyone, and welcome. I hope you're doing well, and thank you for joining us this evening. Looking at the uh, list of attendees, I see so many familiar names in attendance, and a bunch for the very first time. Now, regardless if this is your first Horizon Community event, or you've been to them all, we're extremely happy to have you all here. And I'm sure all of you are as excited as I am to learn about how marketing can be made simple for Home Inspector. Sounds too good to be true? Well, we're going to show you how exactly it can be done. But before we get to that, my friends, introductions are in order. Can you advance slide for me, please, Richard? Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm from Horizon Inspection Software. Tonight, I'm just going to be helping in the background with any technical issues you might encounter during the presentation. And later, I'll help moderate during the Q&A. So if you do need my assistance, feel free to chat with me during the presentation. I'd be glad to help you out. Now, joining me this evening is our community leader, Mr. Alan Carson, founder of Carson Dunlop. How are you doing tonight, Alan? Brian, I am great. How are you doing? I'm doing great as well, Alan. I'm uh, super yeah. eager to hear what, pardon me, my, uh, what you have to say and what your esteemed colleague. So if we can pass along, Richard, we have Mr. Richard Hope, Dark excuse me, Director of Marketing for Carson Dunlop here as well to share his pearls of wisdom. How are you doing tonight, Richard? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Brian, and, uh, and Alan, looking forward to this. Awesome. Awesome. We're so excited to have you here tonight. It's great when we have a guest with a lot of experience like you do. Okay. I'm going to shut up in just a second, I promise you folks, but I'm just going to explain the control panel. There's a couple key functions I want you mindful of. So that orange button we're highlighting right now, you can expand or minimize it. For the most part, you're just going to keep that minimized. But if you do have to select your preferred audio method, if you go in to the next slide, you'll see that there's a section for audio. And most of you are going to be listening already through your speakers. But if you have any issues, let me know. But you select phone call, get a toll-free number, dial in, and you can listen through your phone as a contingency. Okay? And the one last spot I want you to be mindful of is questions. So at the bottom slide, you're going to be able to submit your questions at any time. Okay? I'll, do, I'll help with the Q&A. And any technical ones, I'll help during the presentation. But I'll be there in the background for you. So submit them at any time, my friends. All right, let's get on to the agenda. All righty. Brian, thank you for that. And uh, welcome, everybody. Appreciate you being here, taking the time on a, uh, a midweek, uh, still summer evening, right? It's not fall yet. It's still summer. It's all good. Um, I am going to be uh, kind of... Uh, chirping in from the sidelines and letting Richard uh, kind of uh, do the heavy lifting tonight. Um, as you can see, and I'm not going to read this agenda to you because it would take me 15 minutes. Um, we have got, we don't do anything fluffy at Carson Dunlop. There's never anything light and superficial. There's no filler. So there's a ton of meat on the bone here. And I'm going to encourage you to take uh, this and a, a couple of thoughts. One is watch, enjoy, think. And then I might suggest this is one that you might want to watch once the recording comes out again, because you're not going to be able to digest everything that Richard uh, throws at you tonight, probably. And I'm going to encourage you to kind of focus in on what might work best for you. And I don't expect you to uh, take all this and run with it, certainly not in one bite. So there's a lot here. Don't get overwhelmed. Remember, you're going to have the, uh, the recorded version to come back and zero in on the areas that you want. So um, there's a lot. I hope you've got a, uh, a large, suitable beverage to uh, keep you comfortable. And um, yeah, let's get on with it. And as always, when we get on with it, we should start by asking a question. So Brian, the poll master, do you have a question that you can put up uh, for the group? Because I think it'll really help Richard to have a sense of what you folks are all about, what your state of mind is, what your situation is. So Brian, over to you. Sure, Alan, no problem at all. Also a couple comments saying they love your hairdo. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, my good friends here. Uh, what are you most likely to do? Let's get this poll launched. So in terms of marketing, three choices here. What are your thoughts? 
Do you typically handle marketing yourself? Do you outsource it or do you avoid it altogether? We'll give uh, about another 10 or so seconds. The audience is participating really quickly, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. I always hate this part, Brian, because you never let me vote. Well, we know your choice. <laughs> All right, I, we've got 89% and we have over 140 people tuned in so far. So we've got a healthy, healthy response rate. Let's go ahead and cap this off here in just one second. All right, so my friends, let's see these results. So 89% handle marketing themselves. 7% outsource it, 4 avoid it altogether. Interesting stats. Well, Richard, I don't think we could have set the table much better than that for you. That's exactly the audience you want to talk to, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it tells me there's there's a, a lot of people, you know, focused on, on their own marketing, which is great to see. Um, some, you know, outsourcing, some not doing any. I think it's... it's it's a nice mix, although the, the vast majority doing their own, and, and that's kind of perfect because I, I think the focus tonight is is really to help uh, folks kind of do that themselves and give them a few useful tips to just take take their marketing a little higher. And so, yeah, thanks, thanks, Alan, thanks, Brian, for for teeing that up, and and hi everybody tuning in. Uh, I'm really happy to be joining you uh, tonight. Share some thoughts on marketing in the home inspection industry, and uh, I think let's just jump right in here um you know right off the top you know just like alan said there's going to be a ton of stuff in these slides uh, a lot to digest and, and and you know alan said it well i don't think we expect you to adopt, adopt everything but especially not right away but i think the goal could be to find a few nuggets here that you can you can leverage for your business so first off you know marketing works it it, it does if you look at the infographic to the right you can see you know the the stupid amounts of money being spent by the top brands on advertising right uh, uh, into the hundreds of millions per year and you might be sitting there wondering how it's relevant to a home inspection business and, and it's not really but um i leave it here just to demonstrate that these companies wouldn't be spending the money they are um, if it didn't work or wasn't necessary for them to reach their sales goals uh, you know and just like adt or at t and mcdonald's they're competing for attention with Verizon and Burger King, um, you as a small business owner in the home inspection world, you're also competing for attention among your industry competitors. And, and so the ones who work to optimize their marketing, they can rise to the top and not, not necessarily by spending gobs of money, but just to put in some effort to make sure that, you know, the key elements of, of the business are as good as they can be. And so those are the kind of things we're, we're going to review uh, this evening. Um, Know your audience, and this one's absolutely fundamental because you you should be wasting as little time possible marketing to folks who aren't interested in your services, right? Today's world of digital and online, it really is easier than ever to tailor your audience. We'll we'll be talking about that some more later on, and in our profession, we might have a few key targets like consumers buying homes, selling homes, real estate agents, of course. So it's important to really think about each of those categories. What's motivating them to buy from you? What's their individual definition of success? Because it's probably different between those three groups. Stay focused. I, like I find with marketing, there can be a lot of things to juggle at the same time, you know, whether it's website, social media, advertising, all the reporting you need to look at. It can really just get pretty overwhelming and, and even daunting. So I'd say for anyone tuning in tonight, if, if you feel this way about marketing as well try tackling your goals more one at a time prioritize what you think are the, the biggest gaps when it comes to your marketing um, and start there and once you've achieved a goal or got it into a better place in that specific area then you can start to expand on it or move on to the next goal double down on what works um, it's really important to report on your marketing performance. You want to be, you want to have visibility, so you understand what's working, what isn't working, you know, as well as how things are trending over time, because things always fluctuate and, and need attention at various times. So, when you're in a position to really understand something's working well for you, you should try pushing it even further uh, uh, if you can. And here's a note. Yeah, please. No. I just no. want to jump in and say that. 
one of the things that always put me off about marketing for maybe the first uh, 30 or 35 years at Carson Dunlop was it was so tough to measure the results. And what has changed is technology. And Richard's going to talk about it, but it's become so measurable. And it, there is so much data out there that it has completely changed my thinking about marketing. And I've always hated the concept of, you know, if you put up a billboard, how would you know how many people ever looked at it, how many people ever reacted to it? But the world has changed so much. And Richard has taught me so much about what you can learn as you market and how you can tweak as you go that it's really transformed my attitude. So I would encourage you to kind of take that point to heart and think about it and see how you can make it work for you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I came into marketing in more traditional media, you know, TV, billboards, like you said, Alan, and, and be in the digital space, it's so much easier to know who you're targeting, who you're reaching, and who's listening, and, and who's, who's acting. And so um, it's really, it's as good a time as ever to, to be invested, especially on the digital side. Um, a note on your existing customers here, um, you know, we're going to spend more I'm on this a little later on, but just wanted to emphasize the importance here that it usually costs a lot more money to get a new customer than it does to get repeat business from an existing one. So you should never stop marketing to those folks, um, especially real estate agents. Obviously, they have much greater potential to, to bring you repeat business over a long period of time. Okay, so <laughs> here's some tough news when it comes to marketing. Um, People might already be aware of some of this. First, it's it's a very crowded space, increasingly crowded, and, and I don't need to tell you that. You you know the amount of marketing emails you get, social posts you get hit with every single day, and but because it's so crowded, it's become more expensive too. Um, you can see that in the graph. I think that's a, like a five-year span. It's it's the cost um, to acquire someone through marketing has gone up. Um, Spent with social media, right? Everybody's on there now, but getting your message through to them has become even more of a challenge than than ever before. And in general, uh, you know, as a society, I just think we're a little less patient, we're a little more skeptical than we used to be. Um, and the chart on the bottom shows, you know, just how trustworthy a, a salesperson or a marketer is considered among other professions. Not, not very high, sitting there, three percent. Um, you know, lawyers are at twelve percent, so that. That tells you something. So, sure, it's getting tougher to break through. Uh, people are tuning out of advertising more, but what people are focused on is are your customer reviews. And so the chart on the top right here demonstrates that pretty clearly, I'd say, where word of mouth, referrals, they make up the largest percentage for where people go to make you know, informed purchase decisions. And in the word bubbles below, I just clipped a few comments from other home inspectors that I, I, I saw online and just some tips on what they do to promote the review processes, you know, whether it's an email sent after the inspection, some legal link uh, uh, to, to leave a review right in the re inspection report, uh, some legal link on their email signature, so it's, it's always there. So here's what we do at Carson Dunlop around this. So first we work with an online service called Listen360. And this is a web-based tool that it collects and reports on the survey responses and reviews that our clients give us. We always survey our clients after an inspection. Um, anytime that is a positive one, uh, you know, that great review automatically gets posted to our website so we can show it off uh, kind of in real time to, to our site visitors. Um, on top of that, we can send an email to those people requesting a, an additional review from uh, another site, popular site like Google, right? because it's really important to diversify where your good reviews live online. Uh, if you're currently sending emails asking your customers for, uh, for a review, I would encourage you to focus on the sites that are high ranking in your area, right? And you, one way to do that, you could search, search home inspection reviews and then your city name and look at the, look at the pages that rank on page one of the, of the Google results. Those are the pages you want to be soliciting reviews on because they get seen the most, they have the most influence on people who are searching for an inspection company. Uh, and the Richard, third point, yeah. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to throw in a comment and those of you who have listened to me for a while know how much I love Lesson 360 and what a great tool it is. And um, 
to Richard's point, we have uh, adjusted and tweaked some of the things we do with Listen360, and it's it's just like uh, twisting the the dials on a dashboard. It is it is just uncanny what uh, you can do with Listen360, and the fact that we do a survey and get 25% of clients and agents responding to that survey, that is off the charts. So, and just a reminder, if you're a Verizon user and you're not using Listen360, I think it is one of the best value things out there. So I encourage you to have a look if you're not doing it already. Sorry, Richard, I keep jumping in. No, 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 I'm, I'm glad you do. You're, you're, you're adding good stuff here. Um, I think we're on the third point here. This is just around replying to your, to your reviews, you know, good or bad. Right? And they, it can be time consuming depending on the volume of reviews you're getting, but it is definitely best practice. It, it looks good to people searching online, but you know, with Google reviews, um, a reply can actually improve your, your Google search ranking. They, they like to see that kind of thing and they'll reward you for it. Um, so obviously when you get a good review, show it off, and, and of course, as Alan mentioned, a tool like Listen360 can help you do that through you know, the, their website and the integration with your own website. On to the next slide. Um, this one talks about building your credibility through partnerships. And I think, I think this is a great way to improve your marketing efforts because it can tackle a lot of things at the same time. Um, first, you know, if your business isn't so well known, but then you align with, with another business that is more well known, you gain that instant credibility just through that association. So that can, that can help give you a, a bit of a lift um, uh, fairly quickly. Second, it, you're differentiating yourself among your competitors. They might not be doing this kind of thing. And then third, and probably the most important, you're adding real value uh, for your clients. So what do we do uh, at Carson Dunlop? Really exactly that. We, we looked at some of the top brands in our, our service area footprint. Uh, related to things like home maintenance, uh, insurance, junk removal, moving, etc. And we set up partnerships with these groups uh, just to bring added value to our clients. And we've also tried to align with top real estate offices, teams, agents to, to just forge and, and nurture those, those really important relationships. And then when you promote those partnerships, you know, we'll use things like social media or email campaigns, webinars, videos, and events and they focus on the partnership and that, that value add that we're offering. Yeah, Richard, that's so true. And I just wanted to throw in the fact that as we set up our relationships, we did not try to squeeze the last dollar out of every issue. And so we don't ask our partners who appear on our website and get referrals from us to pay us anything. We're looking to provide value and help solve problems for our clients. And the good that that does for our company, I think goes beyond getting a few dollars from them for the referral. So we don't ask them for that. What we do ask them to do is take great care of our customers and some of them give our customers preferred rates. So we try and do it in a way that keeps them wanting to work with us and take really good care of our clients. Because at the end of the day and over the long term, that's what we think builds our business. To me, it's all about reputation and brand over the long term. So we don't fuss and try and get a short term return out of this. It's definitely a longer term vision we have on those kinds of relationships. Yeah, well said. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into a few points about just how important it is to differentiate yourself in your profession. And, and I hear this time and time again from consumers and, and, and agents, you know, when you run a, a business, you're just assumed to do a capable job, like you, you call that table stakes. Um, so what you're actually judged on is how you present yourself. And that includes every single touch point that you have with your customers, starting from you know, your website, that very first conversation on the phone, even your car, your appearance, all the words you use, a lot of it really just comes down to your likability and it's all really crucial to setting yourself apart. Um, and, and there's an interesting chart here that we've pulled from, from Listen360. I think, Alan, you wanted to, to mention this for a second. Yeah, because this offended me when I, when I first realized what Richard said was true, I was very upset. As a home inspector, I always thought the most important thing I can do is do a really good inspection for my clients. 
And so to me, it was about the technical skills, the knowledge, the report writing, and all of that bundle. I came to learn a little bit with Richard's help and over a lot of time, clients actually already check those boxes and give you credit for that. They already assume that you have mastered your craft or you wouldn't be a home inspector. So when you look at this chart, this is a list of the most important words that have come up. These are from thousands of reviews from clients. And what's important to them, the first three words, efficiency, staff, professionalism, none of them really have anything to do with the quality of the inspection or the technical skill of the inspector. Home inspection one is a bit vague. You finally get down to the fifth point and they say knowledge in some cases. And then you're back into courtesy. So it's all about those soft skills, those tangible things that they can measure and evaluate because they can't tell whether you're doing a really good inspection or not. They just assume that you are. And it changes your thinking a little bit. And it really dials up the importance of how you make your client feel, how you greet them with, you know, that the old adages about smile, firm handshake, which we can't do with COVID right now, but asking questions, connecting with your clients, uh, caring about what their experience is going to be like in the home. That relationship building, I had no idea, was so much more important than the table stakes of just doing a really competent technical inspection. So this has been a bit of an eye opener for me in the in the last few years. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, and the next point here is is kind of an extension of the first, um, you know. But those hours you spend connecting with your client during the inspection are absolutely vital to getting that great review and getting that future business. And, and you know, you're the, as the inspector, you're, you're just the unbiased expert and, and the one in their corner. Have someone great answer the phone. Uh, this could be yourself or someone else. And, and I'm gonna kick it back to you again, Alan, because I, I know you had a, a, a good anecdote around this one um, about maybe a recent interaction you saw. Yeah, this is, one of the wonderful things about Listen360, by the way, is it is a terrific way to start your day. So in the morning, uh, I wake up to look at our Listen360 reviews from the previous day. And this one is from about a week and a half ago. And Michael is one of our customer service people. And the words that this client used, and I think this guy took the time to write, I don't know if it's a guy or a woman, sorry. This person took the time to write this about a customer service person. And you think people take it for granted. You think they don't notice. You think if you keep them on hold and uh, don't necessarily answer their questions directly, you think they don't notice, they absolutely do. And so this is just the perfect example that as you can see, as you read through it, the client didn't even get the house, the deal fell through, but he took the time or she took the time to talk about our customer service person and our inspector and how we made them feel, how we took care of them made so much difference. And that to me is just such a powerful lesson to never forget to go the extra mile for your clients and do what you need to do to absolutely take care of them. So yeah, I was, uh, it, it, it brought a smile to my face for the first hour of my day reading that one uh, about 10 days ago. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, next one, this one's around getting involved, get your name out there in the community. And, and I've shared a few examples here of how you might do that, um, whether through business associations, maybe more charity type initiatives uh, for a good cause. One idea I heard recently was to collect coats for donation and offer your clients a, a little discount in exchange. That's a great one. Be unique and be likable. Uh, follow through on your promises, say thank you, maybe bring a gift to the client or agent. This kind of thing can really can make you memorable and, and someone a person would want to do business with again. Uh, offer services others don't. And we'll cover this a bit more in a moment, but it's it's obviously a great way to set yourself apart, right? To organize a webinar for, for agents to educate them and, and help them navigate issues in a home. And um, I heard from one inspector 
he he now in, accepts Bitcoin as as a form of payment, and he's the only one in his area to do that. And, and according to him, it's, believe it or not, that point alone has, has brought him some new business. So that, you know, there's always kind of unique ways to consider to to stand out in the crowd. And last point here, um, be prepared to adapt, and this is kind of a two-parter. First, prepare to adapt to all the different personality types that clients and agents will have. Uh, your own presentation and style, it may have to change based on the client's background. In my experience, the, the best salespeople, they always have this quality, you know, being able to kind of adjust on the fly, and it's, it's the main reason they're, they're successful. Um, but another reason to adapt, it's just like most other industries, uh, the home inspection can be, you know, the, the market can be volatile. Um, in relation to real estate, the state of the market, we've all noticed a trend where buyers are, are often waiving home inspections because it's their only shot at winning a home, and, and that's obviously a big concern in our world. But it's also a situation where we might be forced to adapt, uh, at least until the market normalizes a bit. We're all hopeful that that happens soon. Um, so that could be focusing more on sellers' inspections, pre-list inspections, when, when buyers might be waiving them more often. Um, and then another obvious market factor is COVID. Um, Alan, you mentioned it. It's, it's had a huge impact on our business, just like uh, you know almost every other business. And things have started to come back, but there there will be lingering effects on our industry that that will last a while and then kind of forced us to adapt in, in certain ways as well. Um, let's come back to those existing customers for a second. Um, We've noted why it's important to, to maintain those relationships. So let's let's look at a few points on how to do that. Um, really, it's about identifying your opportunities for repeat purchasing, right? Your your existing customers, they've already made a purchase. They know you, they like you, they trust you. Um, so if, you, if you've provided them a good experience, you've given them a reason to do business with you again. Um, so consider things like offering your clients an, an annual maintenance inspection, um, ancillary services, either at the time of the inspection or maybe more importantly after the inspection. And I say after because real estate agents often don't like inspectors selling add-ons. Um, it might cause issues or obstacles to, to the sale of the home. So adding those services after the inspection can, can just be a good way of getting around that. Don't compete on price. Uh, <laughs> my time working with Alan, this is a point I know he feels really strongly about and, and he always uh, delivers more eloquently than I could. So maybe Alan, I'll kick it back to you. You can give some thoughts on this one. Yeah, you, you run the risk of uh, getting me launched on an hour diatribe about this. But um, yeah, the bottom line is don't compete on price. Uh, it's not a competitive advantage. You drop your price 25 bucks and the guy across the street competes with you and drops his 25. And it's a suicidal race to the bottom. Um, in the first place, the professional consulting services we provide are by a wide margin, the greatest value of any service around a real estate transaction. And I would argue that our fees are too low. And it breaks my heart to see people out there dropping home inspection fees to do my, to get a little bit of business. I think, and, and part of Richard's message is, there are lots of ways to compete, provide better value, solve more problems. But for goodness sake, one of the easiest ways to recognize a new home inspector in the market, and this is what real estate salespeople tell me, is if the fee is really low, you know he's a newbie who doesn't bring anything to the table. So for all you folks just getting started, don't go there. Get your prices up at least into the middle of the pack. Be proud of what you do. Provide the value that you know you can and find a different way. Please do not compete on price. I'll shut up now. Okay, thanks, Alan. All right, hopefully, uh... We're all, uh, uh, you're still still with me. We're gonna move into the world of uh, digital and online marketing. And I think, Brian, you were gonna tee up a poll again. Yep. Certainly. Just give me a second here. We'll get that bad boy launched. Right. All right. So friends, you got a website. Simple question. Now, you update it. That's the real caveat to it. And if so, 
Is it every six months or within the last six months? So you're doing it semi-regularly last year, two years. Is it collecting dust on a shelf? Let me know. Actually, let us know. And I'm going to assume that if you don't have a website, you're not checking any one of these boxes. So I'll be interested to see. I'm, I'm going to figure it out by subtraction at the end of the poll, how many folks do not have a website at all. And if you're a student just getting started, I absolutely get it. I understand that. If you're an experienced guy, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. So did I create enough airtime to give people a chance to uh, respond to the poll, Brian? Enough. I was just going to say hindsight. That would have been a good fifth option. <laughs> uh, the things you, the things you think of afterward, Alan. <laughs> awesome. We keep learning, Brian. We keep learning. All right. We had 55% of our audience vote, and we've got, uh, let me see here. Let's pull, share the results here. So our resounding 68% said it's been updated the last six months. Kudos to all of you. It's been updated the last year, 14%. Last two years, 8%, and don't remember last time it was updated is 10%. So, uh, and we had 55% of the audience vote. So there is a number of people suspiciously absent. Back to you, Richard. <laughs> well, it's good to, it's good to know that, that, you know, the majority are uh, kind of tending to the website, um, you know, fairly frequently and, and as they should, um, you know, having a, professional website, it's, it's just one of the most important assets you, you create for a small business. It, this, is, this is where you show who you are, what you offer, where you are, um, how a potential customer can get in touch with you. It's, it's something you always own. Right? Other platforms like social media, they could change, they go in and out of style. Um, you know, the, the website is yours ongoing. Um, it generates traffic. It's, Place to send traffic from any advertising or marketing that you're doing, and it's not just a brochure, and you shouldn't treat it as, as, as that either. It's it can be a 24/7 salesperson. You know, you, you're you're trying to convert that traffic into leads, so you really want to make it professional. Um, and I'd stop here just to mention a service called Inspector's Edge. Uh, you know, they can help you build a great website. It's designed with best practice for home inspectors in mind. Um, Alan, I think you might have some points you wanted to make on this one as well. Yeah, Inspector's Edge is a, is a fascinating company. And again, we talked earlier about having partners and we partnered uh, with Inspector's Edge uh, when they were first getting started, probably 10, 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago now, because life uh, happens pretty quickly at my age. Um, and they are graphic designers, uh, through their heritage and they have become so good at this and again we have a relationship with them they give preferred pricing to uh horizon users to our uh, students and uh they really take care of them and what i love about it is they use some of our content they use their beautiful visuals and they will build a website for you for absolutely zero dollars and host it for you for free for six months and then you pay about 36 bucks a month after that which is less than 10 percent of one inspection fee so it is incredible value it's built in such a way that you can manage it yourself and add content in like using it like a word document drag and drop you don't need to know any website stuff to be able to use it better still if you don't yet have a logo they'll help you with that if you don't have business cards letterhead a brochure they will help you with all of that they will help you with making your website make sense because they understand some of the things richard has been talking about in terms of best practices for website what google likes and what google doesn't like so when i think value and and again i want to be clear there's no money that changes hands between inspector's edge and carson dunlop we we have a sharing customer interest relationship we do not have a financial relationship so we do this and we recommend them because we believe it solves problems for home inspectors so if you haven't had a look at it especially for whatever percentage of people don't have a website yet or if you have one and you're not thrilled with it this is a really fascinating thing to look at so i'll leave it at there but it is worth your while to have a look at inspectorsedge.com 
Thanks, Alan. All right, um, on to SEO, that's uh, search engine optimization. And, and here I'm talking about organic ranking in Google. This is not paid advertising. This is this, the, the free stuff. Um, the paid stuff is more often called SEM. Um, and put simply, SEO is just, it's all about ways to make Google rank your site above others. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do this. Some are fairly simple. Some get highly technical and, and you could probably spend hours talking about them. We're not going to go there right now at all. Um, I'll just say, you know, if you find this stuff a bit daunting, you may want to look at getting professional help. And again, a service like Inspector's Edge can help you get up and running. And, and once it is up and running, it doesn't need a ton of, of ongoing maintenance. Um, but for those who are a little bit keen on this stuff, um, let me give you some best practices. Um, first is to understand your keywords. These are the words that are relevant to your business and your industry, your profession, that Google, they're going to pick up on when they choose which sites to rank on a search. Um, and to the right, I've offered a few for you guys that might be useful. Um, um, you know, I've also supplied a link to a Google resource page that helps you to define those keywords that are going to work best for you. Um, Next, check the speed of your page, see how fast it loads. There's a, a link also there where you can go to perform that test. Um, because if your site is running too slow, Google won't like it. They won't rank your site as fast uh, or sorry, as high on, on searches. Um, and often a simple fix on that is to a slow site. It's, it's the embedded images that you're using. Sometimes they're just in a file format that's too big. So when I find when when you audit that you you reduce or compress the file size of, of your images, all of a sudden your site speed can can improve pretty good. Um, next, next, make sure your site looks good for people on their mobile phones. Um, and again, I I've, I've provided a link uh, to run that test. You may want to screenshot this this slide because there's some good stuff you can take away here. Um, and basically, if it's not mobile friendly, Google can penalize you for it. Um, obviously, on mobile searches and that's a big bucket of traffic, um, bigger than you might think. I think uh, about 60% generally of, of total traffic to your site is going to come through mobile. So you want to make sure it's, uh, it looks good for, the, for that, uh, that group. Um, and make sure your content's thorough. Try to use bullets and numbered lists. You know, this is something Google seems to prefer when they crawl websites. Um, try using YouTube links. And big surprise there, uh, Google owns YouTube. They're going to reward people who use their video service over any others. Um, and again, investing in professional help, I, I touched on already, so, so let's, uh, let's move on. But I wanted to take a closer look now at, at a pretty easy way to improve your SEO um, and look great when someone searches your name online. Um, and, and the best part of this is completely free. This is a, called Google My Business. I think it's had a few different names in the past, um, Google Local Listing or, or Places. Uh, but basically, this is the box that appears to the right of a, a company Google search. Um, and I've shown you Carson Del Lops there on the screen. Um, and according to Google, this type of listing, it's, it's highly viewed. Uh, and so it's just really important that the information there is accurate and valuable. So here's some best practices. Um, you want to go to the Google My Business page. Um, you can Google that to find it. Um, claim your business profile as your own if you haven't done that already. That's really important. Then you, you make sure all the, the fields are populated with accurate information, um, especially around your hours of operation, when you're available to take calls. Uh, you can upload photos and, and do it a lot. Google likes, seem, they seem to reward businesses that, that keep a, you know, a steady stream of content or, or photos. Um, make sure you answer any questions that get asked through here. You could even get a friend to ask a question there so you can answer it. You're just adding good content to that profile. Um, next is reviews. We've talked about this, but just to say, if you ask for a Google review and they submit one, it's going to show up here. And so you, you should respond to all of them, even just a simple thank you for a nice review. Um, and and uh, last thing, just always keep an eye on this profile over time. Make sure it's in, in good shape. If I had just one takeaway for this page for SEO in general, it's, it's kind of captured in this, this red box at the bottom, which is that if Google sees you as an authority in home inspections in your area, your, your rank will climb higher than others. One of the things that, that Richard said that I didn't realize was, and 
it's a fascinating point to me because oftentimes you feel like, well, everything's already been said and everything's out there and there's so much great content on the web. Why would I bother? But what Richard told me was, no, Google looks very locally. So if somebody else has got a great story in Seattle and you happen to be in Boston, Google will reward you for a good article on the same topic. They don't like to see plagiarism and, and just copies of exactly the same article, but just because the topic has been addressed by others isn't a reason for you to shy away from it. And it can be a newsy item, it can be what Richard calls an evergreen item, which is all over the home inspection community. The stuff that we talk about tends to be relevant over the long term, and I'm stealing Richard's thunder a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating, and I didn't realize that was the case. So it's just a small encouragement uh, to go ahead and uh, bite the bullet, do a little work on it, because you will be rewarded. Because Google, at least, is locally sensitive, even though they might be global monsters. They do take care of you locally. Yeah, yeah, and they and they do it well, and and they do it more and more. I don't think they always did it that way, um, but they. You know what? What they've got increasingly good at is getting just highly localized. So, um, for sure, you made a really good point, and that kind of dovetails into this slide. And I think you were even touching on it a little bit, Alan. Is, is blogging and um, this one's? It's a tough one for a lot of business owners, um, even people like me. You know, I work full time in marketing, um, but it's, it's just very time consuming. But it, it is just a fact that blogging is really important when it comes to your SEO, your search engine ranking. Um, the more often your keywords appear in your articles, the more likely you're going to appear in search results. So naturally, a great way to do that and become an authority is, is to block. So if you want to commit, I, I can give you a few simple tips to get, get rolling. Um, you know, make, make the content high quality, make it helpful who, who, for, for people who might be reading or, or searching for it. Make your posts you know, between 500, 700 words. And you, could, you, you need to write with SEO in mind. I, I touched on that a second ago, but you know, it's, it's all about how Google thinks and rewards businesses. So whatever your keywords are that you think people are searching for to find a good home inspector, you use those words and phrases in your blog articles and, and, and you're kind of, you're, you're cueing Google to, to serve your results. Um, make it evergreen. Yeah, Alan, you touched on this and, and that's just, don't make your articles, you know, super focused on or sensitive to a date or a certain event in time, because they become irrelevant to readers later on. Um, and I think in in the world of home inspection, there's there's good opportunity here because the kinds of issues we find in the home when inspecting them, they they stay pretty consistent over the years. Um, and definitely, yeah, to Alan's point, don't get discouraged if you think there's a million blog posts about the same thing. It, Google is localized, and so if you've got the best article in, in your, your city or town, then it's, 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 it, it, it's going to matter, even if there's a, a million other articles elsewhere. Um, lastly, I'd just say, that, you know, look out for a, a free or a cheap blogging tool to integrate with your website. And I've posted a few here uh, you can look at, but in general, I'm sure if, you know, you have a website, the platform you're on probably has a blogging integration tool, you know, WordPress or GoDaddy, stuff like that. So um, uh, you, you should be good there, but uh, right. on to social media. So social media, you know, might seem like just a fun platform for people to socialize and connect, but uh, of course it's, it's a really powerful business tool as well. And, you know, I suspect a lot of you uh, tuning in already understand that. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that social media can also help you increase the authority of your website. It can improve your search engine rankings in Google and, and other search sites. And it's, you know, it's obviously, it's just a good way to engage with your potential customers. Why wouldn't you want to be seen where your potential customers spend all their time? Um, so marketing and social media, it's all about meeting your audience and, and customers where they are. Um, and the benefits here, you know, they're pretty self-explanatory. Maybe let's just look at an approach to a strategy on the right. Um, first, make sure you focus on the platforms that suit your audience. Um, you know, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, they're all huge. Facebook's by far the biggest. I think it's like almost 2 billion daily active users worldwide. 
Um, but the type of audience matters, right? Facebook's more Gen X, millennials. Uh, Twitter's more millennials. Instagram skews a bit younger. Um, you know, LinkedIn is, is even getting into baby boomers, Gen X and millennials. So, and, and each are good for different things. And, and um, you know, Facebook can be good for advertising. Twitter is known for, for customer service and, and PR. Um, LinkedIn, obviously good for like employment marketing and stuff like that. So just, you know, I won't prescribe um, what the best one is for you, but, you know, understanding you know, that each platform, uh, you know, you should focus on, on where you think you get the, the most, you would resonate the most with your audience. Um, let's jump to the third bullet. I think I've talked enough about making sure your content is unique. Uh, you covered that, but just like blogging, it, it can be really time consuming to post on social media platforms all the time. So to help get around that, I find it useful to use a scheduling tool. There's stuff like uh, Hootsuite, uh, Zoho, Samrush, Loomly. There's a, there's a bunch out there. Some are free, some are fairly inexpensive. Um, and what you can do with this is you can just, this way you can dedicate just a few hours, once every few weeks or month to just work, write your posts, schedule them, post automatically just at various times and, and on the platforms you want. It just makes it a lot more efficient. And I, I think it might help you stay active on social media longer. Instead of what happens with a lot of small business owners, which is that they, they start really strong and then gradually just start posting less and less over time. It's so tedious. So uh, a scheduling tool can help. Um, next one's all about inserting yourself into local or community social groups. And you could use Facebook as an example, right? There's real estate groups, there's community groups, literally, literally every neighborhood in your city um, to join them. Um, but when you do, maybe don't come out, you know, overtly selling your service. You, you end up getting dismissed pretty fast. So um, it can be good to just maybe start sharing some useful home maintenance tips in the groups. No sales hook. You can mention you're a, a trained home inspector with X years of experience. You can offer to answer any questions people might have about home maintenance. And over time, you can become a trusted resource, not even in that much time. And then you can start getting referrals. So in, the, in my neighborhood, there's uh, in my neighborhood Facebook group, there's a plumber. He's He's been posting his tip of the week for years now, and he never promoted his own business, except to mention that he's a plumber, and he constantly gets gets referred in the group when, whenever somebody has an issue. Um, and just on that last point, you know, you, you may want to look for some help here, whether it, maybe there's a professional marketer, or even just a young person who's savvy with, with social media and might be interested in marketing. They want to help you manage your social strategy for a small free small fee, it can be, uh, can be worthwhile. All right, email. No need to explain this one too deeply. Email, it's a fundamental part of uh, uh, virtually every business. But we, we all know that small business owners, they don't have a ton of time to spend on digital marketing. So it becomes so important to automate your tactics as much as possible just to make the process easier. So I'll tell you how Carson Dunlop does it and maybe It'll inspire a few ideas from uh, folks tuning in tonight. Uh, for going after prospects, non-customers, we, we use a pretty inexpensive tool called MailChimp. You can send mass or bulk sales emails to your prospects. It's pretty easy to use. It reports on a lot of good insights, how many people opened your emails or clicked through to your website, things like that. And then for emails based around the booking of a home inspection, our strategy is built in Horizon Marketer. That's a free tool that's part of our home inspection software, Horizon. Um, in here, you can, you can use our pre-built email templates. You can build your own. You can decide when they get sent, you know, for example, uh, the number of days before or after the date of an inspection. You can decide who you want to receive them. That could be the client, that could be the agent on the buying or selling side. And when you're a Horizon user, we, we provide you with 16 out-of-the-box email templates for you to use, and you can just add your company logo, other important details, and, and you're all set with those. Um, using Horizon Marketer, we can send <clears throat> appointment confirmation emails, 24-hour uh, reminder notice, thank you emails to clients and agents. We can request reviews. Um, we can upsell additional services, let's say mold or asbestos, and we can offer a recurral, uh, recurring annual inspection send newsletters, all of that you can build, build and deliver automatically. So you, you don't have to spend any time managing it. 
One of the things I like about this, Richard, and I made this comment in my opening remarks about how marketing has gotten so much more measurable. And I don't know if you can read it, but on the uh, screenshot on the right, you can see that our 24 hour reminder emails are opened almost 60% of the time. And our inspection follow-up emails opened about 65% of the time. So to Richard's point, you can create an email and you can send it automatically and you can see how well it's being responded to by clients. So sometimes changing the subject line of an email can dramatically affect the open rate. But this is the dials on a dashboard I was talking about. It is just so cool to be able to see that. And it takes about five seconds to look at it and say, wow, they're all around 60%, except one is at 85% and another one's at 20%. And so you can adjust and try something different and measure the results really quickly, really easily. And this is all just sweat equity. There's no cost to any of this, just as a bit of time and a bit of mental uh, brain cell work to, uh, to optimize the effectiveness of this tool. It is, it, it's very powerful and so simple, even I can understand it. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at paid Google Ads. And, um, I know already a lot of home inspectors don't touch it. I bet if we did another poll, we'd probably see that. And I saw this poll, which you can see on the screen. I saw it recently in an inspector Facebook group and pretty much confirms that. You can see the vast majority of people who voted don't spend anything on, on marketing or advertising. So, okay, fine. Um, you know, I can understand why people might not be doing this. Maybe they have in the past, didn't, didn't prove worthwhile. Um, I've read just about, just under half of small businesses in general, about 45% do some form of paid advertising. So it sounds like the home inspection profession comes in quite a bit lower than that. And that makes me think there's a real potential opportunity for someone wanting to try and, and differentiate themselves in the crowd. Uh, so pay-per-click, PPC, this is a type of advertising, allows you to pay a fee to have your website in the results when someone types in a keyword or a phrase. And the fee you pay is, is based on whether people click your ad. With. And when it's done right, it can really earn you quality leads. So why you might want to be active? So a couple of things here. You can control what you want to spend. It could be a daily budget, or you can cap how much you're willing to pay for a lead or, or a click. Um, it's fast. So I talked before about SEO, and that is a long-term commitment, but it's got a long-term reward uh, when you invest in it. PPC is totally different. You, you can get quickly, you can get in quickly uh, uh, to the top of the Google search results uh, if you put some money behind it. Um, it's really simple to control. You can turn it on and off. You can adjust your budget on the fly. Um, you can set certain targeting so that you're reaching the right kind of people, um, the right audience that you're looking for, and you're not spending money on clicks for people who aren't actually looking for a home inspection. So if, if uh, you're still with me here, and and maybe ready to test the waters with a, a PPC campaign, I can give you a few suggestions. Um, the first one, you need to understand how competitive your local area is. This is probably the biggest indicator of how successful you might be with this. Um, so the easy way to do that, you just Google home inspection or home inspector and then your city name. And in the results, um, look to see if there's any other inspection companies paying to be at the top of the rankings. Uh, you'll know that if you see the word ad, it'll be in capital letters, bold letters uh, beside the result. Um, and if there aren't any, or maybe even just one or something, you may have a really good opportunity to get low cost clicks, uh, especially if, if there's nobody there competing, right? On the other side, if your result has four ads or more, you know, it's gonna be harder and it's gonna be more expensive because it's more competitively intense. Uh, next one is to test small scale upwards uh, if necessary. So you start with a minimal daily budget, very small bid per click, and just see what happens. If you're getting no clicks, there's nothing lost. Um, bring your bid up slightly with the, just, you're trying to find some kind of sweet spot where you're getting a few leads, but you're not paying more than you want for them. Um, you want to set your audience targeting right, you know, based on your service area towards, you can do it towards certain demographics like age or uh, household income, stuff like that. Um, 
Next, you want to track your results. Google has lots of reporting tools available to do that, but I would say Google reporting can be a little complex. <clears throat> and that, that kind of brings me to my final point, which is to get professional help if you need to. You can find a local freelance marketer who knows your area, might be able to help you get off the ground with, uh, with some Google ads. And a big question I think people will ask is how much you should pay Google for your clicks and leads. And, and again, it varies based on where you live. So it's hard for me to, to tell you knowing that, that our audience on this webinar might be uh, spanning uh, North America, but you know, it really boils down to your, your own gross profit margin, what you might be willing to shave off of it to expand into a new channel. You know, you wanna think of it, you think about the lifetime value that a new lead might bring. Assume maybe it's one inspection, but uh, you know it, it could bring future business. You might get a real estate agent that, that uh, you, you stay with for a while, and you're also just building your brand and awareness through that. And so all of a sudden, you know, paying ten bucks, <clears throat> excuse me, fifty bucks for a lead or a sale, it might not sound so bad when you when you take all of that into account. All right, let's move on to something else. This is getting it more out of the digital world into the real world branding. Branding gives you, it gives your business an identity, it gives consumers something to relate to, makes your business memorable. It's really the face of your company, helps people distinguish your business from others. And, and of course it helps support your marketing, gives it that extra punch. So you want a great logo, other creative assets to define your brand. Once you got something you like, you can start developing collateral to help promote yourself. And business cards, that's an obvious one. You know, I've, I've heard success stories some inspectors, you know, stuffing cards in realtor racks or Home Depot, Lowe's, grocery stores, Chamber of Commerce, insurance offices, stuff like that. Branded thank you cards, that's another great tool to use. You leave them behind wherever it's appropriate and then they almost always get read and appreciated. There's also gifts to leave behind, pens, stress relievers. Some, some people find those annoying, but there's no doubt it's a, it's a good way to keep your name on someone's mind after you have an interaction with them. And for the last two there, um, obviously a branded uniform, add some professionalism, use some uniqueness to your, your presentation, and then a vehicle branding, a wrap, that can add a lot more scale. There's a lot of eyeballs that will see your logo and your service uh, you know, every time you're driving around. Okay, let's talk about how you manage your leads and customers for a moment. So, you know, as your business grows, it, it gets really hard to manually keep track of all your prospects and customers with spreadsheets and random notes. So that's where CRM comes in. CRM is customer relationship management, basically stores a company's interactions, you know, with potential existing customers. And it's, there, there's a lot of positives to it. It allows for better customer service. It's just a lot easier to give a customer a good experience when you know a lot about them. And just being able to see at a glance, you know, all the interactions you've had, it just gives you a major leg up. And it, and it makes you more productive because you can automate a lot of your tasks. And so, yeah, another shameless plug for uh, Horizon software because that's, that's really what it does. Um, you know, with Horizon, you've got the report writing tool with the, with the great looking reports, lots of design flexibility. You've got the scheduling tool, 24-7 online booking, mapping for distance drive times. We've got client and agent databases, and of course, we've got the desktop and the mobile app options that, that kind of work together in harmony. Um, and I, I wanted to stop there because we, we actually have a brand new Horizon mobile app launching very soon, uh, and it's a pretty pretty significant overhaul of the current version. Um, a lot of exciting new features and functionality, and I'm going to stop there. It's, it's the topic of our next webinar in October, so I won't spoil anything, but I would just leave it that any current Horizon users, anyone thinking of switching their, their competitor software, they you know, you should be getting pretty excited about this launch. Good for you, right. Richard. Don't give away any secrets. <laughs> I, I did want to say, come back to Horizon, and this is in no way a plug that I would feel the need to apologize for. There's a tool in Horizon that I'm guessing less than 10% of you use. And it's exactly focused on what Richard was talking about. And that tool is at the click of a button, 
you can get a report for any time frame as to how many agents have used you for the first time this month. And Richard talked about thank you cards, and you can probably think of other outreach gestures. But isn't that nice to have a list of people that is produced automatically for you that have used you for the first time this month? And at the same time, you can click the next button, and you can get a report that says, hey, here's an agent who had been using you, and they've stopped recently. Now, for you to scratch your head and figure out how to get that out of Horizon would take a long time. But we've done that for you. And at the click of a button, you can get a report on agents who have stopped using you. And you can use that data to, in my world, I say pick up the phone. Maybe uh, more modern people do text or email, but I'm, I'm old school. I think picking up the phone, touching base with the agent and say, hey, we, we're, we're missing you. What's happened? Are you okay? What's going on? And that outreach can make a difference. And we have uh, had some gaps in that over the years. And then every time we get back to it, every time we step away from it and then come back to it, we bring a whole bunch of agents back into the family. And it, it works, it's powerful, it's there at your fingertips, it's free, accessible, and please use it. Okay, Richard. That might be a sales pitch, but I absolutely believe that's great value. Thanks, Alan. Um, all right, we are we're in this home stretch here. This is this is the last section of our webinar, but it's it's a topic I'm sure of great interest to a lot of home inspectors out there, given that the real estate agents are they're often the gatekeepers to our business and, and our success. So so how do we market to them? Um, let's let's look at a few tips here. First, the old 80-20 rule, which is pretty universal, but applies in, the, in our world as well. Basically, when you target and win successful agents, they'll bring you a whole lot more business than, than uh, a less successful one. Um, second, always do everything possible to make the agent's life easier. They're, they're very busy people. They're usually really focused on doing everything as efficiently as possible. Um, so if you don't fit into their ideal workflow, you, you may have trouble winning them over. Well, you can offer an online booking tool, offer them support on the phone when they need it. And ask yourself why an agent should trust you with their client and their deal. Define, define your points of difference. That could be related to your background, your experience, or just the, the awesome service you provide. And, and definitely don't be shy about spending a bit of money to win them over, just considering the lifetime value that, that they might bring you over the years. One example of spending some money could be taking them to lunch. So when you, if, you, if you do, when you sit down with them, get them talking, listen closely and be respectful, of course, and you wanna look for pain points that they might be having uh, with, with their business and, and, and their clients and see how you might be able to, to resolve those. Just a, Another a good quick, one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Richard. Um, huh? One of the, the things that I think is important when if you're talking one-on-one -on -one to a real estate agent, whether it's uh, over lunch or under any other circumstances, a couple of things, and Richard said, be respectful. So I love to be asking them questions instead of selling myself, asking them how they got into the business, what makes them so successful. And, and people are generally fascinated to talk about themselves. I know I am. The other thing is, I think it shows great respect to say, you probably have a relationship with a home inspector and we're not looking to disrupt that. We're just looking to provide you a solution and be your second choice if he's ever not available. And so showing that professionalism of not coming in and trying to steal somebody else's business is a very subtle little way to earn respect and to perhaps get a foot in the door. So there are lots of little strategies around that, but I did want to share those because I think that uh, is very helpful. For sure. Uh, networking, we, we've touched on this already, but you know, again, you can get involved with, with real estate groups, uh, events and charities that, that real estate offices might be involved with as well. You can join some associations, real estate associations as an affiliate, and it just ways to get some good exposure to build those, those vital relationships. Here's a good one. Um, ask a broker or manager to allow you to come speak to their team, whether live or via webinar. And if and when you do get the chance to speak 
try not to make it an ad or, or a hard sell. You want to give them tips that help them buy and sell homes, build their credibility. You want to make them look good. Use a newsletter. It, these can be tough to get right. You need to be pretty regularly generating good content to, to share with your, your database, but there's no doubt that real estate agents will be interested in reading them if, if it's going to make them better at their jobs. You know, send an email newsletter bi-monthly or monthly, quarterly, and just, just impress them with your knowledge. Host a appreciation party. This one probably tricky with COVID, uh, depending on where you live, but uh, it can be, it is a good way to forge those relationships in a more casual setting. Right? You might get to know these people a little bit better. You can kind of show your human side, which, which is important to real estate agents and who they choose to work with. Alan, do you have, do you have a note on this one? Yeah, I do. I've got uh, a colleague uh, in Toledo, a friend of mine, and they do something unique in their market. And during the summer months, they do a parking lot barbecue at real estate offices over lunchtime. So they will provide lunch to the agents and the staff at the real estate office. And again, it's that casual atmosphere, showing your human side, giving people something of value and food is always of value. Um, so we've never done it. It feels like a big commitment to me, but these folks tell me, well, I know that that's what they're known for. It becomes part of their brand and they've been doing it for years. And, uh, it's a little outside of the box to me, but very clever. And uh, they've got it down to an art. They do it really well. They keep it simple, make it fun. And uh, it is definitely a brand builder. Nice. All right, open houses. This is a, a tricky one. It can probably backfire uh, if done wrong. Right? I, I find face-to-face -face marketing, it's just tough uh, for sure. but. But the fact is sometimes you, you gotta step out of your comfort zone to, to land um, you know, some, some important customers or some important business. So if you do wanna visit an open house, you, know, you wanna meet the agent, try to show some interest in getting to know them, maybe bring a thoughtful gift like some water, leave a business card, maybe a coupon for an inspection. But you, know, you should be mindful that the agent is preoccupied they're probably not in the mood to spend a lot of time with you. So maybe don't talk too much or you never interrupt them when they're busy and, and really not wanting to stay too long either. And, or, you know, leave with a giant stack of business cards on the table. It's just, it's all about tact there. Uh, last one here is, is to use social media to connect. We covered social media, but just to say, basically every agent is active in social media because it's important to their job. So you can find the good successful ones to follow engage with them respectfully when it's appropriate you know as an example if you liked part of an article they just shared or tweeted you know you can say so you can you can add to the conversation you can ask questions that that push that conversation along you can even share the article through your own channels and, and let them know that you shared it all right i think we made it not so bad <laughs> um before we jump into some q and I, I, maybe I'll just summarize uh, by saying, I, I think there's a ton of opportunity for, for a home inspection business to make good strides on the marketing side of things. I, I hope I've been able to give you some useful tips on how you might get there. Um, so I'll just leave you with, with a few reminders. Stay focused on your goals and objectives. Never stop marketing to those existing relationships, especially your high value real estate agents. Always be asking for reviews after your inspections. Make sure the positive ones get promoted online, get, get shown off. Um, and a reminder to get out there in your community, make yourself known through networking associations and, and charities. Um, to be adaptable, both to the people you deal with, you know, whether it's clients or agents, or just the market forces, the market trends around us. Um, and a, a general reminder to put in work to optimize your, your digital marketing when you can. It's, it could be your website, your SEO, social media. You want to make sure you've got that great CRM tool so you can get you know, best in class customer service and, and automate your, your own workflow, which of course Horizon does. And, and then lastly, just to win those big real estate relationships with, with a mix of tactics that we, we just discussed, just, just making them help, help them be better at their job. So 
I want to uh, sincerely thank you for spending the time with me this evening. And I hope you uh, found it beneficial. Thank you, Richard. That was fun. And uh, as, as you can tell, Richard has had an impact on me and the way I think about our business and the way I think about marketing. And uh, it's been fun to, uh, to get an education. And uh, when you think you've got it figured out, realize that there's some pretty significant gaps in your knowledge. So uh, it's been, it's been a, an interesting journey. And uh, yeah, somebody put up a slide here about something Richard touched on. Let me just, uh, and I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, Horizon Mobile 3 is coming. It should be launched in October. Uh, we think it's pretty darn cool. Uh, October 27th is the scheduled date for uh, a webinar that's going to be focused on that. And at the heart of the issue is report writing, which I think most of us would agree is the necessary evil part of the home inspection business. The, uh, the inspection performance is fun, the writing it up not so much. So we have been working really hard to minimize the pain and maximize the gain on report writing. And uh, I have been tweaking this for far too long and uh, it, it's been it's been in the oven a while and it is well and truly baked now. So it'll be, uh, it'll be out very shortly. Uh, and uh, um, my team has been patient with me while I've been uh, meticulous and uh, they, they call me a perfectionist and that's probably fair, but I am, I'm so proud of uh, this new product. It's gonna be, gonna be a lot of fun and uh, I hope it's gonna make your lives just a little bit easier. But we should probably move on to Q and A. Should we, Brian, or is there something else that I've forgotten? No, I think we're perfect timing for Q and A. We got plenty of questions for both you and Richard. Uh, so Peter has a twofer. Uh, <clears throat> first question, um, probably directed more so to you, Alan, but uh, maybe both your insights. An agent was with uh, her client, so he does post post excuse me post purchase inspections. Keeps them in business. Uh, last week, a home inspector contacted the agent and offered to do walkthrough inspections. So post book inspections, half an hour, $200, no contract, no report. You know where I'm going. I can already see your face. The agent now wants him to do the same type of inspections. Rock in a hard place. Or he's going to go with the other inspector. What are your thoughts on this? You know, what uh, maybe perhaps marketing strategy behind how to combat that? Uh, so we'll start with that one. Well, why don't you start with a hard question instead of throwing the, uh, the, the easy loves over the net, Brian? Um, yeah, you. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm muttering to myself. Let me start with a gentle introduction. I hate walkthroughs with a passion. I do not think they are home inspections. I think they expose home inspectors to significant liability for not much money. And I may have said this publicly once or twice before, but when you do a walkthrough or you do something that doesn't have a written report, you are well and truly flying blind because most E&O companies will not defend the claim if the home inspector doesn't provide a report. Do you think the clients understand when you say, I'm just going to do this? You can have all the disclaimers in the world, and they think you did a home inspection, and they think you are going to tell them about the big stuff. Can you just look for the big stuff? No, you can't do that because you don't know what the big stuff is. It's just not physically possible to provide good value and not take a huge liability risk. So how you market that, I might leave that answer to Richard, but I would say that real estate agents who ask home inspectors to do this, perhaps should be asked to do half of their job for half of their commission. It's just not fair, it's not right, it's people taking advantage of a hot market 
and the home inspectors are being squeezed. People are not doing business. And I've had so many inspectors tell, well, I'd rather get something than stay at home and get nothing. I would love if we would stand together and not play this game. And I understand how tough it is, but this is wrong. We should be talking about pre-listing inspections. We should be talking about pre-offer inspections. We should be talking about post-purchase inspections, which is where Brian started with what this gentleman is doing. I think that's terrific. People need a real home inspection. Believe me, I've been at this for 43 years. If I could figure out how to do it in half an hour, I would have done it a long time ago. I can't give people what they need. And having somebody else say, oh, just do this and it'll be fine, it's just not right. Sorry, Brian, I'll stop now. Brian, you muted. Sorry, there, yeah, I had two spots. <laughs> Great insights there, Alan. Appreciate it. Uh, Richard, anything to add on that? Uh, I don't think I could ever match the uh, passionate delivery <laughs> Alan just gave. But I, I mean, yeah, I, I, would, I would focus on, yeah, the, the, you know, I think you made a point, Alan, of, you know, people needing real home inspections, and that's what I'd focus on marketing and, and, and standing behind. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, second part of that question is in specifically for the Ontario market. Do you find that pre-purchase inspections are part of a finished offer? Uh, commonly, Alan, part of a, the offer. Pre-purchase inspections are. Sorry, I didn't hear the last part, Brad. Are part of the offer? Part of the conditional. It's part of the conditional. Oh well, um, yeah, less and less right now. So it, it's hard and has been hard in our market for home buyers to put any kind of condition in their offers for home inspection, financing, or anything else for some time. So yeah, I think um, it has been super tough. And I, I can tell you that uh, our strategy has been to, when one door closes, you look for another to open. And we have focused on pre-listing inspections. And I did a, uh, a TV piece today with a real estate agent and the question came up. And I said, first of all, and I'm gonna say what, what I said to the real estate agent and their community, I'm gonna say the same thing to our community. And that is that the home inspection profession should be moving 100% to pre-listing inspections. Every home should be sold with a home inspection report available, full stop. That's the right way to do it. And when sellers don't get this, and listing real estate agents often don't get this, but what it does is it brings more buyers to the table. Everybody knows you can't put in a conditional offer right now, and in our market, at least, buyers are being told there's no time to do a home inspection. You can't even do a pre-offer inspection because we only have 30 minute viewing slots available. That is such an artificial crock, I cannot stand it. But nonetheless, that problem goes away if the seller does a pre-listing inspection and I don't know that sellers and listing agents understand how many buyers, I've got five kids and three of them have bought houses in Toronto in the last three years. And there are a good chunk of buyers who will not come to the table without a home inspection report available or the ability to get their own home inspection done. So that's point one. Point two is when people have a home inspection report on which to base their decision, they make more significant offers. It's not riverboat gambling anymore. It's making a commitment to pay this much for a house because you have some clue as to its physical condition. The third and last point is that I don't think sellers, and in some cases listing agents, understand the liability that they're taking on by forcing buyers to buy a house blind, the people move in, they're unhappy. We are seeing more and more lawsuits coming back to sellers and the listing agents for failure to disclose and for misrepresentation. 
So I would say to a seller, sell your house faster, bring better buyers and more of them to the table and reduce your liability. That's the message we have to be getting out about pre-listing inspections. Everything else is a stopgap. Post-purchase uh, inspections don't help people make an informed decision. They help them move forward with looking after the house, staying warm, safe, and dry, protecting their investment. Terrific that way, but that doesn't help them at all during the transaction. The pre-offer inspections were great, except it's frustrating when you only have a 10% chance of getting the house because you can't afford to pay for 10 home inspections until you finally get a house. And that's assuming that the uh, listing structure will allow you to do that pre-offer inspection, which isn't always the case. And then the walkthroughs and the rapid inspections and the quick inspections and the five point inspections, you've heard my opinion on that. So I am a huge fan to go back to where I started. Our focus over the last two years has been on pre-listing inspections and about two thirds of our home inspections done at Carson Dunlop are now pre-listing or seller's inspections. That's where we have moved to. A, I think that's where the future is. And also there's just no opportunity on the other side. So that's a black and white explanation and highly oversimplified, but I always oversimplify because I just don't understand complicated stuff. No, Brian, do you want five minute answers to everything or am I supposed to be doing a better <laughs> job than that? Sorry. No, I think that was great and great insight. Uh, everyone really appreciates it, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to maybe to uh, greener pastures. I <laughs> hope Richard, uh, Google Trends. Do you, uh, what are your thoughts on using them to perform SEO on your websites? Yeah, I, I use it from time to time. Um, I, I find it a useful tool. You can kind of basically, this is a, a tool where you can plug things in to see you know, whether a topic is increasing or de decreasing in, in kind of popularity or, or discussion um, on the web. Um, so yeah, I, I often use it as a reference point. I, I wouldn't call it, you know, a, a, a huge piece of my kind of marketing toolbox, but it's a good reference for, for you know, sometimes to validate what you might think. You're like, oh, I keep hearing about this more anecdotal. Well, you can kind of plug something into Google Trends and, and have that validated or not validated, right? You know, is, 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 is the mass market also thinking the way you are that something seems to be bubbling up or, or in decline? And so, uh, yep, I, I'd say useful tool. I, I didn't talk about it tonight, but um, a, a good point, you know, um, definitely a, a way to spot trends, uh, both upwards and downwards for sure. Awesome, thank you for that, Richard. Uh, yeah. Another one, Richard, would be, Google, you're talking about having the business profile on Google. Yeah. So a lot of home inspectors use their 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 personal address as their office, right? Their home address. So what is your suggestion on that? Should they add their actual home address there or what would you propose? Make it a peel box or Good question. I, I, you know, having not worked um, in a situation like that, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how Google would treat something like that, because of course you don't want to pin on a map um, on a Google search necessarily that's pointing straight to your house. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd probably want to take that away and understand. PO box sounds reasonable, although I'm not sure Google would allow that either. So um, what I believe you're able to do in that Google My Business section is, is kind of disable or hide certain inputs. So if, if you're in a situation where you can't really drop a pin on a map for, um, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the mass market to, to be looking at on Google, I believe there's a way to, to hide it. So just that, that, that piece of, of your inputs in Google My Business is hidden. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I, I don't have the, the full answer to that on top. I'm going to I'm going to throw in a, a a couple of observations, Brian. I see a lot of businesses that do exactly that, and not necessarily just home inspectors. But I've uh, I've looked up some businesses lately, and uh, surveyors, appraisers, uh, people in real estate related professions. But a lot of them are in fact uh, sole proprietors working out of their house. I don't think it's terribly unusual. And if you have a reason that you don't want to give your, your home address, I absolutely respect that. But a lot of businesses do it. 
and um, it's pretty clear that what is listed as a business address or this is the company address and when you look at it it's, it, it's clearly a house where people live and and remember if you have an address on your website whether or not you do that on the uh, on your google page people can still google the address of the company and see that it's a house uh, google's pretty powerful tool and uh, they're going to see what the building is so i might to be honest with you, if it were me, I'm not sure I would worry about it unless you're uh, such a shifty business uh, person that you're afraid they're going to figure out what you're up to and come get you. But uh, I don't know. I don't have a great answer, but I can tell you I see a lot of people doing it and, and allowing their house to be displayed. I will say that uh, very, uh, very uh, graciously, uh, Daryl and our chat just mentioned that he had a similar circumstance. And what he had to do is actually set it to be a service area, and that allows it to prevent your uh, home from being shown, but you service that given area. So that's something you can do in Google. They're getting too yeah, far yeah. down that. Yeah, it kind of shows a radius around your area rather than a pin. Yeah, yeah awesome. Uh, now, Jim would like to know, and, and this may be hard, but I guess depending upon your vehicle and things, do you know roughly, Richard, how much a vehicle wrap costs? Um, I... I think somewhere in the range of three to five hundred bucks, um, but it's been a while since I checked a, a former former job of mine. We we did one and it was around that. But uh, I guess it, it can depend on the size of the vehicle. You know, if you're in a van or or uh, versus a you know more compact. But I, it, it's somewhere somewhere around there. It also might depend on how how big you want to go with the wrap. You know, are you are you decaling you know, the front, back, and sides, or or maybe just a, a smaller one? So. I'm sure it, it probably varies a little bit, but uh, a, a good professional service will run you a few hundred bucks for sure. Awesome. Right. I'm, I'm going to chime in with a thought on, on that, and it's, it's such a fair question. And yet, what I've come to believe is that whether the answer was $200 or $900, how would you amortize that? over the period of time that it's going to be used and how many people are going to see it and how many inspections is it going to be out on. And I would suggest to you that even if it's $900, that represents a pretty good investment in being visible. And people get so focused on the cost of a service or a product and forget about the result, benefit, or value of that product. So, yeah, vehicle wrap to me is a great example that you shouldn't decide to do your marketing based on the difference of $300 one way or the other. You need to say, how many people are going to see this? How many people are going to remember it? How many uh, roadsides am I going to be parked at where all the neighbors are going to be walking by and driving by and and how much value does that have to me that becomes part of the equation how do you put the ROI on it go back to a comment I made at the beginning some marketing is hard to determine what the return on investment is and I would maintain that's kind of a billboardy problem because it is hard to measure unless you put for example a different phone number on your vehicle wrap than your normal phone number, in which case you can track the the calls that come in that way. But I don't think most people would go to that that extent. So I I just would encourage people not to make their marketing decisions based on the swing of a little bit. And I'm not saying that the person asking the question did. That wasn't his question. I'm just saying I'm off on a bit of a tangent. But I do see people making what, in my opinion, are very poor decisions to save a couple of hundred bucks when the reward is in the thousands of dollars and they will have long forgotten whether they paid 300 or 500 bucks for a service. Yeah, and, and I would just add that, you know, that those eyeballs that are seeing it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily gonna give you a lead from someone driving on the highway. It's, it's all about just, just a touch point to, to make someone aware of your brand, right? So that, they saw it on the highway, they probably forgot about it, but then they need a home inspector, um, you know, in a couple of months and, and your name popping up in a Google search might trigger something based on what they saw on the highway uh, a month ago, you know? So it's just, you know, I think I've heard before that it takes, I don't know, you know, seven touch points for someone to, for 
someone to kind of register a brand in their mind. So there you go, right? This is this is kind of one step along that journey. So. Awesome. Uh, Richard, Ali would like to know, he's a recent mm -hmm. Carson Dunlop graduate. And so he's obviously starting out, getting his feet wet in the industry. And in terms of getting his own website, you know, is that, do you feel it's absolutely critical? Um, what, you know, you made a suggestion there, but how on the scale of one to 10, how, how important is it in the grand scheme of things? If, if you're getting up and running and, and um, you know, soliciting for business and trying to win uh, clients and real estate agents, it's, it's, it's essential. I, I would say it's probably one of the most essential things to do. It's why we started with website and the digital marketing portion of, of this webinar. Um, again, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's the piece you own online where people can come find you and, and kind of learn about who you are. So I'd say it's, it's fundamental. Can you get by without one? Sure, you can kind of use social and, and you know email, do things a little more ad hoc. But um, you know, ultimately, you, you know, you're really going to see long longer term benefit um, the sooner you set up a website. I would say. And remember, Ali, you get six months free of charge at Inspector <laughs> Edge. So get your feet wet there, no cost at all. Then make your decision afterward. <laughs> but thank you for that insight, uh, Richard. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, Rico. Rico, hope you're doing well, my good man, tonight. Uh, Rico would like to know, um, is it okay when it comes to monthly newsletters if we use the Carson Dunlop content? So like our blog articles, things like, you know, when when, when things go wrong, uh, resources, do we allow uh, sharing of content of that nature? We not only allow it, we encourage it. Absolutely. So... Anything on our website, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm hardly ever going to be competing with with folks in uh, in most of the markets across North America. Um, my goal is to increase the profile of the home inspection profession and and help help drive the success of everyone on the call. So, absolutely, please use what you would like. Uh, improve on it. Um, share it back. I might suggest, and Richard knows more about this than I do. If you take our stuff and use it uh, exactly as is, I think Google doesn't like that. But Richard, maybe you can help me understand. I, I keep hearing that vaguely, and, and maybe the uh, the folks should should understand a little more about that. Yeah, I mean, Google's quite smart that way. Um, you, you know, to to rehash a blog, um, you know, across a, a bunch of different websites and verbatim. Um, won't won't get picked up by Google as well as unique content, right? They're, they've become very good at um, understanding content that's unique and useful to the people in in your area. And so, sure, I'd say you know I think Alan, you kind of alluded to it. It's, it's a great starting point, maybe a, a great almost a template for for you know a useful blog article. But maybe do what you can to make it your own in, in a few ways. Um, maybe add some some local elements to it to, to the, the area you service just to um, yeah, add some uniqueness and 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 make Google like it a little bit. Awesome. Um, now I have a question here. Sorry, just slid past my screen. Bear with me one sec while I grab it. Kevin. Kevin is new to the industry graduated about four months ago, you know, with COVID, it's a bit of a, well, not just a bit of a, it's a quite a hurdle to, you know, to immerse yourself, break in. Uh, you've provided a lot of good suggestions and tips here, but is there, if you had to like give one suggestion on how to, to bridge that gap initially with, you know, maybe with agents or clients and the current climate, what would perhaps maybe both of you say or suggest? Ellen, you want to take them? Yeah, my my single most important thing I think would be to uh, try and establish relationships with top agents, and and I don't mean face to face way quite quite yet, or at least in in most markets. Now, in in some markets, people are meeting face to face, so I, I maybe have to to qualify what I say. In our market, most people are not comfortable doing that, but. Uh, yeah, um, a relationship established, and when I say top real estate agents, you don't have to pick the top two or three in the in your whole community. You can kind of pick the middle of the pack or upper middle, 
um, especially if you're relatively new. Uh, it's going to be hard to get the attention of the well-established folks. But just like in home inspection, there will be real estate agents who are relatively new but are up and comers and are uh, active and growing and learning and building relationships just like you. So there's a possibility of a good fit there. And again, providing value rather than trying to sell yourself to them, offering to answer questions for them. You can offer to uh, show them how pre-listing inspections work by doing a free one. You can go to an open house and to Richard's point, if you're bold and aggressive and new, and the house has been listed for a period of time, which is a bit unusual in our market now, but if there's an opportunity to say, if we added a pre-listing inspection report, would this house sell more quickly for more money, more comfortably? And so those are the kinds of things I think about. Uh, and it, it's some of the hardest part, and Richard touched on it a little bit, Marketing is easy when you're sitting in your home or office and typing uh, on a keyboard onto a screen and doing that kind of thing. It's much harder to be out in the real world face to face uh, or as close as you can get given COVID. And so when it's harder to do, the good news is very few people do it. So doing the things that are the most, and I have a, a good friend and, and Richard, didn't quite use the phrase, but he used the word. I have a, a colleague that I've known for a long time who is super successful. And he says his secret to success is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And by that, he means going out and talking to people you don't know, putting yourself forward, taking a chance, having the possibility of somebody saying, get out of my life, slam the door in your face, whatever the analogy is in a COVID world. So those risks being taken also have rewards that a lot of your colleagues won't take the risk. So I would encourage you to embolden yourself in these particularly difficult times and take a stab in that direction. Now, Richard will have a three word solution that's way better yeah. no 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 I, I i don't at all in fact that's kind of where i was going to go as well i mean it's it's i've heard it can be you know i'm not an inspector myself but what i've heard from you know just being being around them and, and being on social media groups is is it can take a while to to get rolling um and i think alan you hit on it you got to get yourself out there um not always on the hard sell it's, it's kind of making your name known through educating people who are influential to your success. Um, and and so it can be a bit of a grind, but I think you put it well out on like you, you just you gotta gotta get out there and and uh, get in front of these folks as best you can. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Winfred would like to know, uh, and Richard, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. What about the sources like Angie's list, Angie Lead, uh, Home Advisor, it's just got rebranded, I guess. Um, do you feel that it's worth time to invest in advertise on those sites or is it just a bit of a ripoff? Uh, what is, uh... I, yeah, I honestly don't hear a lot of success uh, stories when it comes to paying to, to be on some of those. Um, you know, I think um, some areas might be better than others, but, but for the most part, I'm not hearing a, a ton of success. In fact, you know, something like Angie's List, I, I've heard of just really Poor quality leads. You may be getting leads, but they're just they're just not um, hot or quality in any way. So I, I personally, I I'd be apprehensive about that. I have uh, myself. Um, you know, again, Google might be might be a better choice to to put your money. Um, and and again, just you know, some of these sites have you know without having to pay to play. Um, it can't. You know, I don't want to say worth ignoring them but just from a paid perspective it's often um, not worth your time with that said you know sometimes these are review aggregators and and sites like that and it's not to say you don't want your your to have a kind of a healthy profile on those sites i'm just not sure i'd, I'd spend a, a lot of money on them i mean it could be worth a test if you don't have to commit long term and, and you can quickly kind of set up a profile and, and 
and, and pay and see how it goes. It's all about testing and seeing what works for you. And, and you know, again, I, I think I mentioned, you know, double down on what works, you know, try all kinds of things, um, see what works, see what doesn't, measure your, your, uh, your, your tactics and, and uh, you know, expand on what works and, and, and move on from what doesn't. Thank you, Richard. That's great advice, uh, Richard. And I, it reminds me of a, of a project that we tried a few years ago. Um, and uh, we got a terrific price on advertising on a radio station. And they were so professional and they uh, helped us with the wording. They helped us record and they were so patient making sure the recordings were absolutely perfect. And we did several ads and they ran them at prominent times and I forget like I want to say 14 times an hour very busy it was just crazy and you know what happened a lot of my family and friends said hey Alan I heard you on the radio and you know what happened to sales not a darn thing so interesting experiment now might have been the wrong strategy I, i've talked to some other home inspectors who have had good luck with radio so don't take that to the bank but i tell the story just to reinforce richard's point uh, i think we spent ten thousand dollars in total which is not a king's ransom but it wasn't insignificant either i got lots of things i could do with ten thousand dollars so um but yeah very much that test measure and reevaluate strategy i can't emphasize enough and, and richard is very disciplined in our organization about doing that and it's something that most of us intend to do start out to do and never get around to doing the hard measurement and evaluation part uh we tend to set it and forget it and uh it, it's something that uh where richard's made a real difference because that's uh that's his stock and trade so I, I appreciate that approach, and I would encourage you folks to uh, to use it to, to the extent you can as well. Great, great insights, guys. Thank you. Uh, Rob wants to know, and this may be more uh, Alan. So on pre-listing inspections, many agents want uh, you to be their marketing advocate. I resent the inspector that finds defects. No matter how tactfully written, they can be touchy about the inspector's thoroughness. Any tips for you know threading the needle of being thorough and objective and still being seen as helpful to all parties? Yeah, it's a great question, and uh, and we try really hard to do the same inspection and write the report for buyers and sellers. But you do get pressure. There is no doubt about it, and you have to make the decision. Uh, one of the arguments that has worked well for us, and I've got a piece from a real estate agent that was absolutely priceless that he wrote saying it's the realtor's job to sell the house and create the marketing brochure not the home inspector and part of his argument was if the home inspection report is all shiny and glossy about the house buyers are not going to find it credible and never mind buyers who may be unsophisticated but the agents representing those buyers and so let the agents know who are asking you to sugarcoat stuff that their colleagues will recognize that this is not the kind of report this guy usually does this is not the language he usually uses um, leaving out the photos that might be scary and so on that would normally be in there other agents are not stupid and they see the difference and that makes the home inspector look bad and it makes the listing agent look bad. So liability notwithstanding and having to sleep nights and having to avoid answering complaints are all good reasons not to change your report too much. But some of those other arguments I think are compelling as well. So yeah, you've, you've got a bit of a, uh, a fine line to walk but I would always default to the uh, just the facts, ma'am, side of that line. Thank you, Alan. Um, looking at the time, I notice we are coming up at the quarter hour. We are about 15 minutes after our planned end time, and we've had quite a lengthy Q&A, really good spirited conversation here. I think what we should do is maybe cap off just one final quick and easy, actually, I lied, two quick and easy questions uh, we always do. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your question this evening, everyone, but we will do our best to follow up with everyone where we weren't able to address them during the Q&A. Uh, so question one, Horizon Marketer, how much does it cost? How do you get access to it? It costs your Horizon subscription, so it's free with the most powerful report writing system available. Um, so zero dollars is the answer. What was the second part of the question? How do you get access? How do you access it? It's uh, we access it through Brian and his support team and onboarding team at Carson. When you become a Horizon client, we take care of all that. We show you how. As Richard mentioned, we have 16 email templates already set up for you. So it's a very complex series of, wait a minute, no, it's just one process of flipping a switch. It's pretty darn easy. Our, our onboarding and support team will, will walk you through that. And, uh, and we can, uh, the more creative you are, the more creative we get, and we can help you create any messaging that you like. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty simple, and it's it's all baked into Horizon, and we do work pretty hard to keep it uh, as simple as we can. Thank you, Alan. And Richard, for you, when it comes to sending mass emails, um, what program do you recommend for the average inspector? Is there any like free programs? Because Horizon Marketer doesn't do the mass emailing side of things; it's it's not designed for that. But we you know when you send out mass emails to say the Horizon community and things, uh, what's your suggested program? Do you know of any free sources that the uh, the community could use for that? Um, I mean, we we use Mailchimp at, at Carson Dunlop. I believe there's a there is a free tier. I think it, it probably boils down to how much scale you're talking about. Because once you once you get into you know a larger scale database, you're just not going to be able to do this for free. But I don't think it's terribly expensive. Um, so it's it's worth looking into. Um, MailChimp is a good one. You know, it, you want something that is fairly user friendly, um, can manage, you know, unsubscribes people who want to opt out of your emails. You want to be, you know, legally compliant there, so that that becomes important. Um, but to, you know, just some just something that can um, some basic visibility is all you need. Reporting uh, who open, how many people opened your email. You know, you saw some of that with you know, Verizon Marketer tool. You know, something like MailChimp can do that. Um, who clicked through to your emails? Um, you know, let's say to the landing page and stuff like that. So, um, it, is, does MailChimp have a free option? I would need to double check. But um, again, if you're if you're playing with relatively low uh, counts in terms of of your database, um, I don't suspect you're going to spend a lot at all uh, to do that. It's a pretty fundamental part of your business. So. Um, could be worth a few dollars to spend on anyways. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, sure. Gentlemen, any closing, uh, any closing remarks, any closing thoughts? Well, I wanted to take uh, a moment to say thank you to Brian, as always, for organizing and uh, making sure the technology does what it gets paid to do. So uh, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, and thanks to Richard, who uh, we quite frankly put on the spot a little bit to uh, to do this session, and I would say he rose to the occasion and then some. So uh, that is very cool. And my parting thought would be, uh, I can hardly wait till we have a chat in October about Horizon Mobile Three. Yeah, and I just uh, say a thanks to to you guys and Brian for for setting it up, Alan for for helping me along here. Yep, it's my first marketing webinar. Uh, uh, for, for Carson Dunlop, and I just hope uh, it was informative, and, and you may, may have taken away a few things uh, that, that you may try for your own business. And and you know, don't forget you can go back and, and watch this later on. We've recorded this webinar, and I know there was a, a ton of stuff we threw at you, so it could be worth uh, going back and, and having a look because uh, it might might trigger something you you missed uh, the first time. Speaking of that, we will send out the replay this coming Friday, so two days from now. Make sure to stay tuned to look out for your email. We have included all of you on that newsletter. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our Horizon Community event. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good luck on any. Good luck on. I always tongue tie this. Good luck on any upcoming inspections, and be blessed. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night now. Thank you.